Hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, coming today. We're really excited to um, have a lot of people get hands on our simulated data. Um, so first, I'm going to give you an overview uh, of SEER's program, both the goals, the observing strategy, um, one of our science goals, and then I'll introduce the simulations, and then we'll learn more today about our NIRCAM and MIRI simulations. Um, and I'll just draw your attention to the bottom. We do have a website, sears.github.io. We'll refer to it a few times. All of these simulations and notebooks that you're using today are available on our website, and that's also where we'll continue to release uh, new simulations and hopefully not too long, uh, real data. And those are all also hosted on Space Telescope's website. We also have a Twitter handle, Sears underscore JWST, that is not super active right now, but hopefully will be as real data starts to come in. So uh, I'm going to show you first figure one from the proposal, which was our strategy map which sort of uh, motivates the observational strategy and science strategy we came up with. So the overall single line goal of SEERS is to demonstrate efficient JWST parallel survey exploration of the high redshift universe. We basically want to show how you could do an efficient blank field survey for galaxy evolution from basically redshift 0.1 to however high we can go uh, using two instruments at once. And uh, so we wanted to test coordinated parallels, this line here, and in this program, we do near spec plus near cam at the same time, MIRI plus near cam at the same time, both imaging and near cam GRISM spectroscopy. Uh, we want to test uh, astrometric accuracy of near spec MSA observations and slit losses, although some of this uh, uh, was cut from our work package due to uh, funding constraints, although the data will still be there uh, for folks to look into slit losses. We want to test redshift measurement efficiency, so we're doing uh, in the same fields. Uh, both the R of 1,000 grading and the R of 100 prism, as well as near cam grism. So you might see some objects observed in all three. And also test different MIRI filter pairings. So you can have, if you'll see in our, in our um, layout, we have uh, different MIRI pointings. We have six of them, and so they don't all have the same filters. So our observing modes with near cam are short and long, long wavelength imaging and R of 1,500 slitless spectroscopy. It's very different from the very low resolution slitless spectroscopy you're used to. Uh, with Hubble, and that presents its own uh, benefits and challenges. With near spec, again, we're just using the MSA, but with uh, both the R of 1000 grading and the R of 100 prism. And the GTO, near spec GTO teams, is covering uh, our field with R of 2700 spectroscopy. So ultimately, you'll have that as well. And finally, like I said, MIRI imaging. And so, what are our main science drivers? Uh, the program was built around trying to explore the Redshift 10 universe. So we want to uh, get a very good idea of what's happening at Redshift 10, where we've just really hit the tip of the iceberg with Hubble, one, maybe two galaxies out at that epoch, and scout out the emergence of galaxies at even higher redshifts. On the near-spec side at high redshift, we want to provide a large spectroscopic sample at Redshift 7 through rest frame optical emission lines. These are redshifts where we've uh, so far only been able to really touch them with Lyman Alpha and maybe the occasional carbon-3 line um, and the rest frame UV. Now we can move to the rest frame optical where we know the emission line should be very strong. At slightly lower redshifts, we will have multiple emission line diagnostics to study chemical evolution and feedback in galaxies. With our imaging, our high resolution near cam imaging, we want to trace structural evolution and mechanisms for galaxy and supermassive black hole growth. Uh, and finally, with the MIRI imaging, we want to characterize mid infrared diagnostics of star formation, dust attenuation, and AGN evolution. And again, we're going to do all this using two instruments at once. So here is uh, one realization of what Sears may look like. Uh, we are going to observe in the extended Gross strip field. This is one of the five Candles fields. And uh, we'll talk about scheduling, but no matter when Sears is scheduled, we will observe in this field. That's something we've talked about with Space Telescope. And even if this doesn't happen within the nominal three month ER, uh, ERS window, it will still be the EGS. And so in this diagram, we have 10 near cam pointings. So over here is near cam pointing number one. You see there are two squares because near cam is basically two cameras, has two modules, but you get them both at the same time. And in each observation, you get a short wavelength filter. That's one of these three here and a long wavelength filter, one of these three here at the same time. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 near cam pointings. And then each one has either a red or a green colored uh, square or rectangle. So uh, red square number one, that's the near spec MSA spectroscopy that's happening at the same time as near cam number one. And here's near spec two, three, four, five, six. And then we have MIRI seven, eight, nine, and 10. Those are happening at the same time as seven, eight, nine. Finally, you see this cyan uh, hatched region. 
those are the four near cam pointings where we will be doing uh, slitless spectroscopy. Um, and what you don't see here, but you'll see in a later version of this, is there's actually a MIRI 5 and a MIRI 6. This figure came from the proposal, and at the time of the proposing in 2017, you could not do parallels with near cam GRISM spectroscopy, but now you can. And so we uh, did a change request that was approved to add MIRI to the near cam GRISM. Uh, uh, exposures. And so 7 and 8 will get a little deeper, and we'll add MIRI 5 about here and MIRI 6 about here. Um, this figure is on our website, so I won't read all the numbers, but you can see the depths. Broadly speaking, uh, for point sources, we should get close to 29th magnitude for sort of marginally resolved high redshift galaxies, maybe 0 0.3, 0 0.4 magnitude shallower. The near cam spectroscopy should get to a few times 10 to the minus 18 ergs per second per centimeter squared, so about as deep as the deepest ground based observations now. And uh, there's a range of depths we'll get to with MIRI. Um, and so this is clearly not as deep as Webb can go. This is an ERS program. We were constrained to be not too big. It's a 64-hour program, a medium program. But each of these exposures, near cam and MIRI, basically represents only 3,000 seconds. So it's very short. And so you can get an idea of just how powerful Webb can be if you actually put some, some real time into it. So science goal number one, again, was uh, the redshift 10 and beyond universe. And depending on which model of the universe is right, maybe it's none of the above, but of the ones we considered in the proposal, we predict that SEER should detect between 5 and 50 galaxies at redshift greater than 10. And the science justification here was we would be able to distinguish between models which assume different star forming efficiencies. And so here I'm showing a version of a luminosity function uh, at different redshifts. This is showing the cumulative number of brighter than minus 19.5 absolute magnitude galaxies you'll find. It's basically the Sears limit. And you can see that uh, if this blue model is right, there'll be you know 50 plus galaxies we'll find, that's great. If the red model is right, maybe we won't find so many. And these models all have differing physical prescriptions. Um, and at the sort of brighter end of the luminosity function, which is where Sears is sensitive to, uh, star formation efficiency is the, the thing that we identified that we think we'd actually be able to pin down quite a bit. Science goal number two is with spectroscopy. Not only will we be able to spectroscopically confirm uh, dozens, if not more, of fairly high redshift galaxies, we'll be able to measure key physical properties through restroom optical emission line diagnostics and constrain things like ionization parameter and metallicity. We expect slit spectra from the MSA for about 1,000 galaxies total. And what I'm showing you here is a simulation of a redshift six galaxy. This is actually produced from the ETC but we'll soon have similar plots from uh, direct simulations. And this is showing uh, a black model, sort of a fiducial redshift six uh, galaxy spectrum. You can see all kinds of emission lines uh, we'll be able to detect. And the red model is the same, except the ionization parameter is one dex higher. And so you can see the ratio of oxygen two to neon three will constrain that very, very well. And that's highlighted a bit in this plot in the bottom, comparing uh, neon three over oxygen two to O3 over H beta and showing how different parameters change, metallicity, ionization parameter, and ISM pressure. And uh, if you have multiple emission lines, you can actually begin to actually place direct constraints on all of these. I should say it is a requirement of ERS programs that we do not do pre-imaging. So all of our slit spectra are on known galaxies from the Hubble imaging in this field. So that's why I said sort of dozens of high redshift galaxies. We think uh, of the known redshift six and greater galaxies in this field, we'll get slits on maybe 30 to 50 of them. And then we'll have, of course, hundreds of redshift three to six galaxies and some galaxies at even lower redshift. And finally, science goal number three, Sears will unveil high resolution restroom optical morphologies for modestly high redshift galaxies and high resolution imaging in the PAH and hot dust continuum for galaxies of moderate redshift. So this is showing a real redshift two galaxy on the left with Spitzer, it's clearly detected, but otherwise not a whole lot else you can say. And these are similar wavelengths uh, that we think we'd be able to see a galaxy at redshift 2. This is from, uh, I believe, an illustrious TNG simulation that uh, Greg Snyder made for our proposal. And you can see this beautiful structure, spiral structure, a bulge there in the middle. This is at redshift 2. This is going to be pretty amazing. And on MIRI, here is another real candles image on the left and a real Spitzer MIPS 24 micron image in the middle of the same place. Clearly, something is emitting. Which galaxy is it? We don't know. Uh, maybe it's multiple of them. And this is a simulation of MIRI 10, 15, and 18 micron imaging of this field, of these same galaxies, modeling what we think their uh, warm dust continuum would be. And now you can see the resolution is fantastic. You'll be able to uh, detect many of them, probably, and study their dust emission. One of the things you can learn from the dust emission uh, is the obscured star formation rate. 
And so the plot here on the right, which is made by Casey Papovich, shows star formation rate versus stellar mass from this simulation. And this line here is showing you the limit of the MIPS Fidel observations in this field, maybe 10 solar masses per year. We'll go about an order of magnitude deeper in direct obscured star formation rates um, with um, Sears. So more simulations. So this is an example Redshift 9 observation. So on the top, we have a real Redshift 9 candidate galaxy in this field. Uh, not detected in the Hubble wideband, but detected very nicely in JNH. So that implies the line of break is somewhere around here. So it's at redshift 9. Maybe there's a hint of some emission in the bluer IREC bands and nothing in the redder IREC bands. This is in a few hours of Hubble time and 50 hours of Spitzer IREC integration. And down here on the bottom is what we get with Sears in about 2,800, 2,900 seconds. You uh, detect it in all the bands. It's a little bit faint here because the line of break is in this filter here even out to Miri at uh, 560 and 770, or 5.6 microns and 7.7 .7 microns. What will the Miri imaging do for you? That will help you constrain star formation histories to measure more robust stellar masses. This figure here is showing that if you only have the near cam imaging, you can pin down the restroom UV fairly well, but there's still some uncertainty in the restroom optical, and that could lead to differences in the stellar mass that you infer. But when you can pin down the restroom optical with MIRI, you can reject, in this case, a more massive model. Finally, uh, with spectra, this is a simulated spectrum of this same Redshift 9 galaxy. Lyman alpha, maybe, depends on what the intergalactic medium is doing, but will be sensitive to other weak uh, UV lines like carbon-3. And then all of these restroom optical lines just come booming out here. So lots of diagnostics to measure. Finally, we have a near cam grism component, as I mentioned. Um, this was primarily functional in nature. We wanted to test the mode and allow direct measure of slit losses by detecting emission lines with the grism, where you get all of the light, and compare it to a uh, slit spectra, where you would detect the same emission lines. And again, we want to demonstrate this as a mode for science. This is a simulation that Nora Perskall at Space Telescope put together, showing, uh, uh, showing dip three different 5,007 angstrom line fluxes. And at the brightest one, you can see both O3 lines and H beta. But even down to 5 times 10 to the minus 18, you can still see the brighter one. This is in 1,250 seconds. And so uh, we're actually going to do two of these observations, one with a row dispersing grism and one with a column dispersing grism. So we'll have, for many sources, 2,500 second depth. This will allow us, scientifically, to perform a blind search for emission lines at high redshift. Uh, when you use the GRISM, you use a filter, and we're using the F356W filter. So we'll be sensitive to O3 lines at redshift 5 to 7, and we expect something like 50, depending on what the equivalent width distribution is, what the universe has in store for us. But we think that almost all of these emission lines will come from galaxies not detected in candles. And so we'll be blindly discovering uh, new galaxies, some of which, many of which, probably will detect in our near cam images as well. And of course, the GRISM will be sensitive to other lines at other redshifts, H alpha at lower redshift, Definitely plenty of those. Perhaps O2 at higher redshift, although again, if the ionization parameter is high, O2 will be weak. So um, we'll certainly look for it. I'm not uh, claiming we're going to detect too many uh, redshift 9 galaxies through O2. All right, so a big question people have is when will Sears happen? The original image I showed you showed Sears happening in June. You can imagine, because we need everything to line up very precisely, our position angle is constrained, and it is to basically within a degree. Uh, but we can do it at two times. We could do it in June, between June 15th and June 28th, or in December, six months later, at a 180 degree flip. And so the top is a version of the plot you saw before, but this is a more recent configuration uh, put together by Pablo Arabaljero, uh, a postdoc at Noir Lab who's also leading our near spec simulations. And here you can actually see those two additional MIRI pointings, five and six. And so this is what we're hoping. This is the APT that is submitted to Space Telescope. If all continues to go as well as it's gone with commissioning, I think there is a chance uh, the entire Sears program could be observed uh, in very late June. The bad news is, even if we were willing to consider a slightly non-optimal position angle, the EGS field's observability ends on July 3rd. Um, it starts to go behind the sun, so you cannot observe it at any position angle between July 3rd and I believe December 15th. So if it does not happen in June, then we have an APT prepared for December um, that we have shared with Space Telescope, but it has not been officially submitted yet. And you can see that one down at the bottom here. It is qualitatively similar. All of the same uh, types of observations just basically flipped in a way. Um, and you'll notice things are shifted a bit and rotated a bit. That's to get as many instruments on these uh, magenta diamonds as possible. 
those are the seven redshift nine candidate galaxies in this field. Actually, five of them are candidates. Two of them have been spectroscopically confirmed already through Lyman Alpha. We have a third scenario, uh, which is what if we can get some time in June, but not all of it? And the specific scenario we've been wondering is that what if the MSA is not quite commissioned, but NIRCAM and MIRI are ready to go? And so our third scenario that we call our two epoch plan is where in June we would do our NIRCAM and MIRI component here. And in December we'd be, we would do our NIRCAM and NIRSPEC component here. And when you add these together, this is what the full configuration would look like. And so you can see to fit everything in, now using two position angles, the near-cam mosaic gets more concentrated towards the center, and the near-spec MSA sort of shifts to the left side of the field. Um, and so we actually like this plan a lot. We can actually get more of these highest redshift candidates in more instrument modes. Certainly, if we can observe everything in June, we will do that. Um, but we have this prepared in case it turns out that maybe we can do some observations in June, and then we would do the rest in December. What are our deliverables? Um, a lot of work pre-launch, um, including continuing to update our spectroscopic target list and MSA configuration, uh, build a website and update it, which we've done, uh, participate in space telescope community briefings and webinars, which is what we're doing right now, uh, maintain a team blog, which we have not done yet, but we will start very soon, um, and then of course make these simulations uh, that we will learn about today. After launch, we will have two data releases. We'll have a version 0.5 and a version one, so version 0.5 is a best effort data reduction at three months after data acquisition, which for the imaging would be a drizzled imaging mosaic per filter, and for near spec would be a single 2D and 1D spectrum per object extracted at the nominal position with no slit loss correction. Um, and on the, the uh, GRISM side, also a single 1D and 2D spectrum extracted down to 25th magnitude. Uh, at uh, data acquisition plus eight months, we'll have another uh, release where we will re-reduce all the data using updated calibrations and any pipeline corrections and updated procedures that happen. And we'll have, again, a drizzled imaging mosaic per filter and PFSs for each filter. We'll have re-reduced spectra of 1D and 2D, including a number of improvements that we think will happen. And we will apply uh, the slit loss corrections that are available in the pipeline at that point. And on the GRISM side, we will try and, and push deeper. Our goal will be 26 magnitude. And finally, we will have a catalog release with our version one data release. Uh, there would be PSF matched HST plus near cam photometry, a separate MIRI photometric catalog, either near cam selected or WIPC3 selected, depending on which of the plans. And on the spectroscopic side, we plan to have emission line measurements uh, such as wavelengths, fluxes, and line widths available, uh, and spectroscopic redshifts. We have a website, as I mentioned. This is just a screenshot of what happens if you go there now. And an exciting recent addition to the website is our data releases tab. This is where we previously released our near cam and MIRI simulations that you'll be using today. And uh, it's either live or it will be live very soon. Um, we have updated Hubble da uh, data reduction in this field. Anton Kokomor has re-reduced the Hubble data and re-mosaic them in this field. And we're releasing those through our website. The main difference from the candles release is updated astrometry now tied to Gaia. And there can be shifts of up to a couple tenths of an arc second. And that's very important um, when you're planning near spec MSA observations. So we're here today for our simulated data, which again is part of our pre-launch commitment. Um, we're using different simulation tools for the different instruments, of course, to first produce raw data, and then we're running them through the Space Telescope pipeline, acting as beta testers for everybody to understand where issues crop up. And um, our simulation leads have been in constant communications with the wonderful Space Telescope pipeline development team, uh, helping solve a lot of these issues before the real data actually comes in. So the simulation team is uh, Aaron Young, who we'll hear from next. He's developed our SAM mock catalog, which we've used as an input for many of our simulations. Uh, Michaela Bagley, we'll hear from after that, who is leading our near cam imaging um, data reduction. She's also leading our website creation. Um, we, uh, not today at this webinar, but Nor Perskal is leading our near cam GRISM um, simulations. Today we will hear from Guang Yang, who's leading our MIRI imaging simulations. And then Pablo Arabal Hero is here, but we're not uh, going to hear about the NearSpec MSA simulations, but we will have those ready to release soon through our website. Um, okay, yeah, and so yeah, the, here at the bottom, I'm sort of giving, saying uh, that today we're gonna learn about MIRI and NearCam, uh, but in the future, this is what we expect to have on our website. Uh, NearSpec uh, R of 100 and R of 1000 simulated data over one series pointing. That will be uh, in a matter of days on our website, and then we'll have more pointings, hopefully within a few months. The NIRCAM GRISM data will have posted in about a month, 
and then we will have pixel aligned near cam mosaics in two months. I've seen the F277W channel from uh, Michaela. It looks very wonderful. Uh, we're still figuring out how to actually reduce the 115W because it has a very large memory requirement, which we think we have a solution for, but um, that's uh, responsible for why those aren't quite posted yet.